Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, The Blight, and his new tome story in Tome 12, The Human Quotient. Ah, Blight. I have a very strange relationship with this killer. He was the subject of my first ever video, and while it wasn't a video that's aged terribly well, it was a solid first attempt, and I'm very proud of it in spite of everything. Due to how uncharacteristically short that video was, I look back on him a while later, in my first ever collaborative project with Ascension. Widely considered to be the Blight main to end all Blight mains and a good friend of mine. Hold on, let me let me make sure I have my shot aimed up or uh, lined up. <laughs> nice, there we go. Oh come on, game over. If I go back to Pyramid Head, I am ending stream. I swear to God, you better not do this to me. You better not do this to me. I swear to God, there better be autosave. I swear to God. I swear to God. If I'm back up here- The primary topic of discussion in that video was the dissonance between Blight's gameplay and his characterization in the stories. The conclusion we ended up coming to was that much like the Blight's obvious inspiration, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the Blight is a being of two distinct personas that act very differently. The well-intentioned and curious scientist Talbot Grimes, and the soulless addict that would manifest as the Blight. The Blight has had plenty of stories covering him throughout the years. He was first featured in the Hallow Blight stories that foreshadowed his appearance as a killer long before his debut in the game proper but was also featured in the Doors Unknown story in Tome 5, which bulked out the character considerably alongside his lengthy base backstory. You might think that a character who already has three stories wouldn't be liable to get another one while there's still older killers out there who only have one. Someday, my sweet prince. But you'd be misunderstanding how much behaviour absolutely loves Blight. They fucking love him. He's a special little boy, and what Talbot wants, Talbot gets, because he's a little angel who can do no wrong. You want add-on buffs? Here you go, adrenaline vial's broken now. You want an ultra-rare Greek Legends outfit? Anything for you. You want a similar that doesn't look like ass? Come on, be reasonable here. In any case, I didn't expect a lot from this tome, mostly because I thought we'd kind of gotten everything we were going to get from the Blight. We knew what he was like before his transformation, we know the circumstances around it, and we know what he became. As such, going back to Blight again just looked like beating a dead horse. And as such, I kind of forgot about it in favour of taking more interest in Jonah's story. But it turns out I was completely wrong to do that, because Blight's new story is a banger. Without a doubt his best story, and I'd say one of the best home stories ever written. And as to why I rate it so highly, I can put it quite simply. The human quotient manages to exhibit both of Blight's personas in a very realistic way that draws us an authentic and intelligent picture of who Talbot Grimes is, and it does this while presenting a beautifully detailed and intriguing world around Talbot that makes the entity's presence in it a tangible and threatening force. Even from the beginning, our introduction to Talbot as his colleague Junion comes to collect him foregrounds the odd relationship Talbot has with his own mind. When Junian comes to collect him, Talbot isn't doing research in his lab like some sort of mad science goblin, he's off his face in a seedy opium den having just come back from one hell of a trip. Addiction has been one of Talbot's recurring themes across all of his stories, whether that be a figurative thirst for knowledge, or a literal craving for the pustular serum that fueled his transformation into the Blight. It also makes circumstances of Blight's base lore where the Black Veil leaves him in an opium den to rot far more bitter, because addiction's a hard thing to kick, and the cultist dumping him there once he was of no further use to them is effectively consigning him to a slow, ignominious death in the throes of his addiction. By showing him starting out in an opium den, the human quotient foreshadows the addict that Talbot will become by showing that despite his reputation and skills as a scientist, that part of him was always there waiting to rise to the surface and consume him completely. So the opening of the Human Quotient not only sets up the main plot of the story by having Talbot join an East India Company expedition, it also ties directly to the events of Talbot's base lore and sets up the blurred line between the Blight and Talbot personas 
all at once. And it does so concisely and in a way that entices you to keep reading. That is how you open a story and it sets an absolutely stellar precedent for how the human quotient plays out. Talbot's investigation into the mystery that claimed the other chemist allows us to discover what happened at the same time that he does, and paints a complete picture using what we already know about the entity and its future plans for Talbot. It's a prime example of giving us a lot of information to work with in a way that isn't just a massive gout of exposition poured over our heads like a thick syrup. Something I've criticised behaviour stories as recently as Jonah's tome for doing, and it's done in a way that doesn't put the plot on pause either. A lot of writers have a habit of effectively freezing any plot development to give the characters time to develop, which can make the story feel very jarring and artificial because life doesn't just stop happening so a person can do a thing to show us what they're like. I call that Chris Chibnall syndrome. Talbot questioning Tomas doesn't just showcase Talbot's character as intelligent and inquisitive despite his drug addled state, it also progresses the plot as Talbot's discoveries prompt him to go on the expedition to Africa because Tomas's journal doesn't make any sense. What's interesting about the journal, I'll get into that later. But if you're a writer looking to show how character and plot can share a scene and develop together, this is a great place to look. As the story develops, Talbot's distance from the rest of the company causes his mind to wander onto the nature of the people he's working for. Again, this is completely in character for the cerebral Talbot and frames the question of, well, the human quotient. Is our humanity defined by our moral compass or by our intelligence and willingness to push boundaries to discover new things? In a way, this is an argument between the emotional human Talbot Grimes and the coldly scientific blight persona that craves knowledge at any cost that both share Talbot's body and mind, and as the story progresses we get to see Talbot reject empathy at basically every turn, his addiction to knowledge consuming him completely. Strangely for a character like him, Talbot acknowledges the value of empathy in the human experience, as he sees it as the defining factor of humans that elevates them above beasts and monsters, but doesn't seem to let it affect his own experience or decisions. Honestly, it's a refreshing change of pace from the other truly evil characters in Dead by Daylight, like the Doctor or the Clown, who more or less treat empathy like it doesn't exist or that it's a weakness. Acknowledging the value of empathy as part of the human experience, but choosing to reject it anyway in favour of knowledge is totally in character, and just like almost everything else in this story, foreshadows Talbot's future where he sheds his humanity and becomes the Blight for good. A great example of this is how he treats Calder, the Black Veil soldier who gets his leg ripped off by the vines. Talbot's first thought is, how long can a man live without a leg? He doesn't worry about things like how he's feeling or the discomfort of seeing a man legged off right in front of him, he's only interested in what happened to Calder from a purely scientific perspective. When Calder loses his leg, Talbot wastes no time in giving him Lord Danum, which is a tincture made from opium often prescribed as a painkiller. But naturally, it's Talbot's own concoction of it, and the dose almost immediately kills Calder. It's left a little ambiguous whether Talbot intentionally overdosed him to give him a painless mercy killing, or just wanted to see what it would do, but we get a rough answer later when he has to treat the wounds of Oswald the Cook. This time it isn't Lordanum he's using, but the serum from the flowers he found in the bleed. And while he tells himself he's administering it for Oswald's own good, he knows deep down that's not why he's doing it. He's doing it because he's taking an opportunity. The company won't let him do human experimentation yet, and right here, right now, he has the perfect test subject, ripe for the dosing and unable to resist. In the same breath, Talbot acknowledges what the moral decision would be, and utterly rejects it once again with each step away from that human factor of empathy drawing him closer to becoming the Blight. And yet despite that rejection of morality and empathy, it's clear Talbot still has his conscience. He just refuses to listen to it. This manifests in the voice of a character we've never seen before, Ina, a former lover of his who grew distant from him due to his experiments. He spent so much time in the lab that she grew jealous and burned his lab down in an attempt to force him to reconnect with her, and this resulted in him breaking off the relationship, 
but not out of anger at her, out of sorrow and regret that he couldn't give her what she needed. He felt guilty for neglecting her needs, and that's why he broke things off. To spare her the pain of that neglect and to spare himself the guilt. At least, that's what he tells himself. Ina is the voice of his empathy throughout this story, questioning his moves and motives as he delves deeper into the mysteries of the bleed. Ina's voice in the narrative reminds us that Talbot is merely suppressing his empathy, not lacking it altogether. And if anything, it makes his actions even more horrifying and immoral, because it's not like Talbot doesn't know what he's doing as unethical, or inherently lacks any concept of morality or empathy. He just perceives these things in the context of how they make him feel. Talbot doesn't think twice about testing his serum on Oswald, or breaking up with Ina, because it's immoral to put one's research by the well-being of others, but instead because knowing that it's immoral makes him feel bad if he does it anyway. Because it spares him the guilt of knowing that he's done something unethical. A truly moral person doesn't need the threat of guilt to cajole them into doing the right thing. So even in his kinder moments, Talbot is still driven by a mercenary desire to be as inconvenient as little as possible. And when he chooses to reject morality, it's not a rejection of the validity of the feelings of others, it's more of a shrug, I live with the guilt, I guess. That erases the responsibility Talbot has to take the safety of others into account during his research, but as long as he can cope with the guilt, his actions don't have repercussions that he cares about. This erasure of responsibility comes to a head once Talbot's left alone, and the rest of the company's soldiers disappear only to be re-sculpted by the entity and its eldritch hunting beast into a tree made of human body parts. A normal person, someone governed by empathy, would be horrified to see what transpired, maybe guilty for leading these people to their deaths and killing a couple of them himself. But Talbot... No, he's mesmerised. This is Talbot at his lowest point, when he truly shows who he is in the dark, and totally disposes of any doubts he had in favour of the mind-boggling possibilities that lie in front of him. The euphoria of discovery, the abandonment of all human responsibilities, is everything the story had been building towards, and Talbot's mind races with theories and speculations about what the horrors of the bleed have shown him. When he's dumped back in the African desert, Talbot Grimes has left a very, very different man than when he went in. All those insane theories about foul energy and humans being used as resources to fuel this great beast, they were right. Everything he thought he knew about the nature of the bleed had been validated by his experiences in the fog, and with the company likely to approve his request for human subjects, suffice to say, the experiments have only just begun. For all intents and purposes, Talbot Grimes died that day, or at least however much of him was left, and the blight was left in the desert in his place, with nothing but an otherworldly blue flower and a ravenous desire to know more. If that was all the story did, showcase Talbot slipping morality and detachment from his fellow human beings as he slowly becomes the blight, it would be a good story. Nothing to write home about, but a pretty solid exploration of the themes the character already had, but looked at in a new way. Sets it apart from characters like the Doctor. But the human quotient goes one step further. It also has a lot of, um, <clears throat> big world building stuff. About the nature of the bleeds, or the entity's world lapses into our own. These bleeds have been alluded to in the Observer story for several years now. Anne Hattie's base law and Kate's tome both gave the idea of the entity directly leaning on the mortal world some weight, but the human quotient is easily our biggest exploration of the phenomenon to date. The second memory in the story starts off strong with nothing too crazy, you know, just a survivor who escaped the entity and lived to tell the tale for the first time ever. The company's main reason to call Talbot in to investigate the bleed is to learn what they can from the last guy to investigate it. Thomas, a former colleague of Talbot's, reduced to an empty shell by his experience at the Entity's hands. Talbot and Junian questioning Thomas is ridden with dramatic irony, because while neither of them know what Thomas's manic scribblings mean, we know perfectly well as readers what it means, with our pre-existing knowledge of the Entity. 
The notion of finding a journal that's far more full of notes than it possibly could be in that time is a surprising subtle implementation of the horrors of the Entity. Because as time flows strangely in the Entity's realm, what could have been years of Tomas' life as a plaything of the Entity was spent in only a week in the real world. And showing this to us not only creates that dramatic irony, but hammers the Entity's otherworldly nature home in a way that we as readers can understand. No need for magical hand waving or techno babble, just a clean image that starkly reveals how utterly out of his depth Talbot is in trying to understand the entity. Once Talbot and the company's men arrive in the bleed, they're more or less stripped to the power and autonomy that they thought they had, as the entity has its way with them. Going into the bleed, they're presented as amoral, egotistical, and confident in their own power. Boasting about their prior work putting down rebellions, and mystifying Talbot with their proclamation that they do not answer to the king. The reason this catches Talbot off guard is because of the real history of the East India Company. It was a company of merchants in part formed by investment from the then Queen Elizabeth I, so the notion of its soldiers not abiding by the authority of the crown was right to give Talbot pause. However, all this ego of an elite band of soldiers colonising foreign lands and answering to nobody exists in the narrative purely to crumble in the face of an ancient and unknowable evil. This is a very typical trope in horror media. Characters driven by pride will invariably attract something to knock them off their pedestal, and that ego means we often don't feel bad for them when this happens. To have me forth. Sure, mate. <laughs> See what I mean? The sheer impossible power of the entity is emphasised with how it treats Talbot and the soldiers. There isn't a single word in the human quotient that asserts that the entity is in anything other than complete control. The soldiers and Talbot are just pawns in its game. Not dissimilar to the trials the entity maintains for its own amusement and nourishment. It starts off just as curious as Talbot is poking him back from the fog, and both unsettling and fascinating him, before picking off the soldiers one by one. Dallin vanishes in the gloom, Calder's leg is torn off by grasping vines that exert no more effort to do so than a child ripping up a sheet of paper. Oswald is snatched up by the beast that prowls in the fog and is left for dead, spending his last moments babbling and terrified before the serum Talbot administers racks his body with debilitating mutations with just a few drops. Talbot understands whatever lives in this fog is toying with him. It wants him alive, but doesn't mean it won't play with its food a bit. And this is perhaps the most ominous part of the entire story. Talbot doesn't escape the grasp of the entity at the end. He doesn't threaten it, or bargain with it, or trick it. It lets him go, with one of the flowers to continue his research. And Talbot might be too amazed with the possibilities this opens to understand quite how worrying that should be for him. The Entity wasn't trying to kill him in the bleed, and as a being for which time and reality do not have consequence, it's reasonable to assume the Entity left Talbot because it knows what he will become. That concept should terrify you because it implies that Talbot's destiny, and potentially all of ours, has already been predetermined and is being orchestrated to the will of the Entity. And given that it's an extra-dimensional monster that feeds off the emotions of vast numbers of people, that's enough of a thought to keep you awake at night. The Human Quotient tells two highly compelling stories at once, which is incredibly impressive when you realise that behaviour often struggles to tell a single story competently, much less two at once. The story of a scientist turning further and further away from his humanity, seeing the slippery slope in front of him and diving down it with barely a second thought, is told alongside the story of the monster that tempted him there, an unknowable horror from beyond reality with power and knowledge beyond our comprehension. If you gaze into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you, and as Talbot Grimes gazes into the tiniest fraction of the entity's power, it gazed back into him and shattered his world completely. And that glimpse of the unthinkable would guide Talbot's research in the years to come. A hunger for knowledge that would drive him mad and cause him to shed his humanity little by little until only a ravenous beast remained. What a phenomenal story. 
the human quotient fulfills every promise a Blight story could have done, and frankly puts everything else about the character to shame. After the Hallow, Blight sets him up as a mystery without any real reason to care about the answer, and doors unknown just beat around the bush without showing us anything we didn't already know, it turns out when it comes to Blight stories, the third time really is the charm. I truly wish every tome story was as good as this one. It's easily one of my favourite tome stories ever, and salvages what would otherwise be an unremarkable tome 12. Yes, it's in the shadow of tome 11, which I'll maintain is the best tome ever written, but the human quotient is still a truly exceptional story that finally gives Behaviour's most foreshadowed and hyped up character the attention he's always deserved. Thank you very much for sitting through this one. I know it was heavily requested and I hope I've done it justice. This video is going to be a really interesting one. We're talking about DVD, Evil Dead and VHS and how they seem to have all gotten one of their best content updates probably ever, all in quite a short period of time because it has never been a better time to be an ASIM game enjoyer. If you want to catch that video, please be sure to subscribe, ring the notification bell if you're interested, and you can check out the description for links to my Discord, my Twitch, my Twitter, and my Patreon if that content is worth your money. Patreons get to see my content a day early, so if you want to be a part of Early Access Gang, the link is right down there. I'm actually playing the new Evil Dead update on Twitch two hours after this video is uploaded, so do be ready for that, it's going to be an absolute blast. And like everything else on the channel, this is brought to you by Wraith Energy. If you're interested in picking up their tasty, sugar-free energy drinks, use the link in the description and code PICKLE20 for 20% off at checkout. That's all for me for now, and I'll see you later. Ta-ta for now.